I guess we'll get started. How's everybody doing? Good conference so far? Yeah. Um, my name is Chad Swarthout. Um, my company is called Electrona. We are a Jamf partner in a variety of different ways. We teach the uh, 200 and 300 level courses in the Washington DC area. Um, we do customer onboarding, uh, jump starts, um, do a lot of you know consulting, professional services. We also manage Jamf Pro instances for some smaller organizations and then provide IT support for some larger organizations. Um, so, you know, kind of to sum things up, we, you know, help IT teams solve toughest problems. Um, our main focus is trying to find out, you know, what are the challenges that you guys are experiencing um, and what can we do to, to help build better tools to save folks time, um, to provide a better end user experience, um, to enable end users to actually help themselves. Um, so just a couple slides as this is a sponsor session. Um, Want to talk a little bit about what we do and if that can be helpful to you guys, please you know, feel free to reach out, give us a call. Um, let us know if there's something that we can help you guys accomplish. Um, one of those services is that managed Jamf Pro. Um, so if you are an organization where maybe you have folks that are you know, more well equipped with uh, Windows networking, you've got other projects, you don't want to kind of handle this on your own, you want somebody to just come in and, and handle it for you, we can do that. Um, probably less appealing to this audience. Um, so talking more about what we can do on a consulting side, um, we've helped organizations with uh, Active Directory, single sign-on integration, um, Nomad, Jam Connect, Enterprise Connect, stuff like that. Um, we have worked on some solutions to build automated software installation and patching workflows so that you don't have to necessarily uh, have a team that are building packages for deployment. A um, number of organizations just don't have sufficient resources. I would imagine that probably is a few folks in this room. Maybe you're the only one or, or part of a small team that has a large number of users to support. Uh, certainly within the education, higher ed, uh, which is a large contingency of this conference, um, a lot of folks are kind of the every person. Um, so trying to figure out a way to uh, at least alleviate those problems of you know, keeping the software up to date, keeping security patches in place. Um, we've been able to help some folks uh, accomplish that. Um, some other projects that we've worked on this year, um, trying to get better compliance on software updates with Mac OS. Um, I'm sure that you know, somebody can relate to this problem, but uh, you know, if we've got computer labs, obviously very easy to schedule maintenance windows, but you know, if you've got somebody who takes a laptop home, it's a little bit harder to find out you know, when can we reliably run software updates and make sure that the user complies. Um, even if we turn on automatic updates, they'll see that nag window in the upper right hand corner and just keep clicking dismiss, right? And say, well, I'll do that later. Um, so we've uh, helped a couple organizations develop some better nagging. We just uh, you know, continue to bother them, generate some help desk tickets, um, maybe you know, get their boss involved and let them know, like, you're actually causing some problems by not keeping your system secure and up to date. Um, and then this last one is what we're gonna be talking about here today, um, is allowing users to migrate themselves to a new Mac. Um, this seems to be a particularly challenging problem for a lot of IT organizations. You get new computers, user wants the new computer, but how are we gonna get the data from the old one to the new one um, and ensure things like you know, the MDM enrollment stays the way it needs to be. Um, maybe you've got DEP and that's really cool, um, but you know, they're gonna go ahead and log in with DEP, set up their user account, get to the desktop, but then how do we get all that stuff from their old computer moved over? Um, some organizations just say, well, screw you end user, um, put it all in Google Drive, put it all in OneDrive, throw it on whatever cloud file storage option you have and you're on your own. Um, but in some cases, we actually, you know, we need to do a little bit more of a white glove service. We need to be able to say, um, we're gonna take your existing user profile, we're gonna place that on the new computer and kind of have a seamless experience from your old Mac to your new one. Um, so that's what we're gonna take a look at in a little bit. Um, and then also just wanna mention our training capabilities. Uh, we are certified to teach the Jamf 200 and Jamf 300 courses. We do those, uh, you know, both on the published schedule in Washington, D.C. We can also do those as private courses. Um, and we can also develop custom training engagements um, for any organization that's looking for that. So if you want to figure out, well, we had our jump start, we've got our users, we want to you know, empower them to do more, but we don't really know how to get there, um, you know, we can work with you to develop a custom, custom training engagement, whether that's remote, whether that's on site, whether it's over a period of time or maybe you know, a couple days. Um, feel free to reach out and we can help set those things up for you. So. Moving on to the really fun stuff. Um, as I mentioned before, computers, sometimes they get old, sometimes they're out of warranty, sometimes you know, we need to give somebody something new. Um, so 
how do we get them set up without having to have IT go around and help each user set up their new Mac? Um, one of those options might be to use Migration Assistant, right? It's built in on the Mac, super easy. All you need to do, open it up and migrate your data, right? Does that work really well for anybody here? Yeah, maybe not. Um, not really configurable. There's a lot of check boxes in Migration Assistant. Maybe not every end user knows what to select in order to achieve what they want. Um, it's not configurable for the enterprise. There's not something where you can go in and you know, customize a plist, um, set some preferences so that Migration Assistant will do what you want it to do. Um, and if you select to migrate certain things, like I think it's the uh, Migrate Computer Settings checkbox, you'll actually bring over the MDM profile from the old Mac, and what happens then? You've got a mismatch uh, with your device, and chances are that device isn't going to communicate. You may actually um, break the DEP enrollment that you had when the user first got the computer, um, and then you're in a state where you still have to go to that user and be like, we've got to fix this. Um, so uh, for those of you who would prefer to follow along with a little bit of code. Um, we do have this open sourced on our GitHub. I'll leave that link up there um, for the rest of the slides, so don't feel like you need to immediately take a photo or anything like that, but it's github.com slash electronus slash migrator. Um, I'm going to walk you through what this looks like for an end user, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we built it. So starting out, our user is just going to open up Jamf Self Service. Um, this could be ported to a different platform. Um, uh, or a different agent um, if you are not using Jamf Pro, but chances are since Jamf Pro is in the title of this talk, you probably are using Jamf Pro. So, uh, user opens up self-service, perhaps in dark mode like I have up here, although realizing on a projector that might have not been the best choice. We'll upload the slides as well. Um, and they just go ahead and click on the Thunderbolt Data Migrator, or whatever you'd prefer to call that. It's going to go ahead and launch a window. Um, we're just using an OSA script pop-up here to display to the user that we can now migrate their data from their old Mac. Uh, we're going to ask them to turn their Mac off, um, connect it with a Thunderbolt cable, boot it into target disk mode. Um, and what this is doing is looping to check to see if there's an external disk connected. So once that computer is connected, it will automatically transition to the next step. But if for whatever reason the Mac had already been connected, um, they can go ahead and click the Choose button as well. That'll bring up a selector for them to choose which volume they want to transfer their data from. So if there are multiple volumes, um, this will enable the user to select which one. Um, in most cases, there's just going to be one. So I'll just select that and click Next. We're then going to ask the user for their local account password on the computer that they're initiating this transfer from. So that's going to be their new Mac. Um, the reason that we're validating the authentication is that we need to have that credential in order for us to create a user account on the new Mac. Um, so uh, those of you who maybe have struggled with some of the trials and tribulations of using uh, uh, Macs with APFS, 10.13 and 10.14, you guys know that you need to have a secure token attached to the user account in order for us to do things like enable File Vault and be able to boot the computer if it has File Vault enabled. Um, and in order for us to pass that secure token to a new user, we can't just use uh, like an account creation payload and a policy, we actually have to use uh, the credentials of an existing secure token enabled user. Um, if you already have this you know, set up as your management account, you could modify the script to not necessarily prompt the user for their uh, password here, and you could use those existing credentials. Um, but what we want to do is make sure that we have something so we can create a secure token enabled user. In the next step, it's going to ask the user which account they want to migrate. Um, so it's going to give them a list of the user accounts that are on the computer they're connecting. In this case, I just for our demo slide here, we just have an account called local admin that we're going to migrate over. Um, but if we had multiple user accounts on that old Mac, it would allow them to select the one that they want to migrate. And then we're going to ask them to type in the password for the user account that they're migrating from. Um, reason for this is when we create that new user account on the new Mac, we want to make sure that we set the same password so that the user doesn't end up with any sort of errors relating to their keychain when they log in for the first time. Um, so what we're doing here is actually authenticating against the login keychain that is on the Thunderbolt connected disk um, and ensuring that we can unlock that keychain using the password the user provided. Um, if they enter in the wrong password, we're going to prompt them and say, this isn't the right password, try again. Um, at this point, what it's going to do is it's going to check and make sure that there's enough disk space on the target computer, the one that's booted and running this application, to migrate the data uh, from the old Mac. So um, if you are trying to migrate, say, 500 gigs of data, and you've got a 256 gig SSD in your new Mac that you're trying to migrate to, we're not going to fill that disk and uh, you know, tell, the, tell the user, well, we filled the disk. That's all you're going to get. We're going to tell them ahead of time and let them know 
this isn't going to work. Um, the other thing is we're going to verify that there is not already an existing user account on this computer um, that has the same short name as the user that we want to migrate. Um, so much like when you use Migration Assistant, if you're logged in, uh, say, with you know, my Chad user and I want to migrate my old computer with a Chad user account, it's going to give me that pop-up and say, well, you know, we need to do something. Um, Migration Assistant says, well, your new account is going to have to be called something different. Um, but in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, you've got this new computer. Um, you probably just logged in once to run this tool. So if this is a new account that you've set up with your name, chances are you're probably OK with us deleting it. Um, so we're going to ask the user and say, a local user account has been found on the new computer, um, and we're going to overwrite that with the user account that we're migrating from the old one. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we make this work in a bit. Um, but uh, we can actually do this even if you're logged in with that user account that has a mismatch. Um, and then what we're going to see is a full screen uh, Jamf helper window uh, that just stays up persistently while this is migrating. Um, just going to say it's going to take a while. Uh, depending on how much data you've got to migrate. Um, this you know, could take a few minutes, it could take an hour. Um, this is uh, utilizing rsync, so if it does get interrupted, at least you can run it again, and it's not going to have to start over. It'll just continue on uh, from where it left off. Um, once that finishes, um, it's going to pop up a dialog box, which actually was on the previous screenshot. I just zoomed in a little bit. Uh, it's going to tell you then you can unplug your old Mac. So we finished the migration. We've got all the data moved over to the new Mac. Um, it's sitting in a staging folder. Uh, because we have a conflicting user account. So we actually create a user folder that's different from the actual account folder because we can't write to the folder that you're logged in with. Um, and what it's going to do at this point is it's going to say, OK, you're about to be logged out. Um, please don't shut down your computer. Um, and just wait until please wait disappears from your screen, and then you can log in. So we had to do something a little bit tricky here because in order for us to get them logged out so that we can replace that user account, um, we want to display something to the user that indicates that something's still happening. Um, so we kind of tricked this a little bit. Uh, we called our user account that we're displaying in the login window, please wait. Um, so those in the room probably recognize this is not actually a dialog box. This is just a user account called please wait. Um, but it allows the user to know something is still happening. Um, what we're doing now is we, uh, we have a launch daemon um, that we're setting to execute that is calling another policy um, to finalize this migration. And what that's doing is while the user's logged out, it's deleting their old user account, creating a new user account in its place um, so that the user can log in. And we're going to then move over uh, that home directory and also adjust the permissions so that that home folder is attached correctly to the new user account. Um, so then at that point, um, our new user will be able to log in. I suppose I probably should have matched the names, but this is my colleague, Kurt, who helped build this. Um, so this is his uh, login. Uh, so that would then have the same name as the user that you're migrating over. So pretty cool, helpful. So let's talk a little bit about how we built this and some roadblocks that we ran into. Um, one of these was we need to be able to talk, you know, interact with the user and let them know how this process is going, kind of instruct them step by step on how to do this, because our end users aren't necessarily super technical. Um, they may have never put their computer into target disk mode before. Um, probably they never migrated a computer before, because before we had this tool, they would have had to ask for IT help. Um, so we wanted to make sure that you know, we're going to give them dialog boxes, show them each step of the process. Um, and that's where you know, we were using OSA script pop-ups. We've also used Jamf Helper in a couple of cases um, in order to display information to the user and you know, some imagery and you know, some feedback to the user about what's happening. Um, I talked a little bit about our disk uh, free space verification to make sure that there is, in fact, enough room on the disk for us to do that migration. Um, we didn't want to provide a, a bad experience for our users where they start this process and then find out that it didn't work and they've wasted you know, an hour of their time waiting for that data to migrate. Um, so we wanted to make sure that you know, we've got some checks in place. Um, also mentioned a little bit about secure token. Um, Part of the trick that we had to, uh, to do here was in order to preserve that secure token, if we only have one secure token user on the computer and we delete it, um, we're kind of out of luck, right? So what we do is actually take those credentials from the existing user account, um, that existing local admin user. We then create a second user account that is just our, basically, a place for us to hold a secure token. So we create a user called migrator user um, that we hide 
we never log in with, but what we use is then we use that migrator user to then recreate the local admin user um, once we've deleted it um, so that we then can recreate it with the appropriate credentials, um, the appropriate home folder, and attach everything once the script is finished. Um, as part of that, we need to make sure that we're using the new sysadmin CTL syntax um, in order to create a user account rather than um, using legacy methods uh, like directory services command line. Um, sysadmin control allows us to create a user with a secure token, um, but we do, again, uh, in order to use that command, we'll need to make sure that we have those credentials for an existing secure token user. Um, additionally, with 1014, uh, we've got all sorts of TCC or PPPC uh, security and privacy restrictions. Um, and what we're doing here is really kind of a big no-no when it comes to uh, the things that Apple is trying to restrict in the OS. Because um, what is the main thing we're trying to restrict? We're trying to restrict access to user data. And what is it that we're migrating? User data. Um, so we need to make sure that all of these processes are actually being executed by a signed binary that we can uh, provide a configuration profile to allow uh, full disk access and also the automation required to send those Apple events uh, to create the user account. Um, because using sysadmin CTL as well as writing a user home folder, um, both of these are things that are protected by TCC. Um, so one of the things that we had attempted early on was to actually have that finalizer um, just be a local script that executed from a, from a launch daemon, which seems like, that seems like a great idea, right? Just, you know, have it run locally. Um, but we actually can't have any of those commands run locally um, as the system uh, because they're protected by security and privacy uh, controls. So we actually have to have a second JAF policy execute um, that runs all of those commands because otherwise we can't whitelist um, those permissions for full disk access and for those Apple events. Um, and then we also have a number of uh, uh, different error codes throughout the scripts so that we can get some feedback as to when this doesn't work. So if you've taken a look at the source code online, you'll be able to see that we have different exit codes throughout each one of these functions um, so that we can validate that, you know, if there's something going wrong, we can identify where it is so that if the user then calls and says, I tried to migrate my Mac, but it didn't work, we can actually get some information about why it didn't work. Um, the script is also written in Z shell. Um, trying to future proof our development, this is kind of more just a point about trying to think about how you're developing your scripts and developing your workflows going forward. Um, obviously, Bash is not being removed from macOS anytime soon. Um, there are all sorts of things that are deprecated in macOS dating back to 10.2 and 10.3 and 10.4 that have not actually been removed from the operating system. Um, but it seemed logical for us to start, you know, porting things over to the default shell in macOS. Um, most of what you'll see in that code is not necessarily specific to Z shell, um, but we do want to make sure that we ensure compatibility so that if in a future version, um, you know, bash is removed or, you know, we want to take advantage of some of the functionality that's available in Z shell, we're able to do that. Um, so just something to think about as you're developing your scripts going forward, um, especially if you're using things that are uh, listed for deprecation or removal. Um, Taking a look at the uh, secure token uh, sysadmin CTL thing again. Um, syntax we're using here is uh, just sysadmin CTL add user, uh, username, password, and then our admin user and admin password. Um, these, what we're looking for, are the credentials of the existing secure token user. Um, if that user is not an administrator, um, we'll want to make sure that that's promoted before we run this command. Um, but nice thing, we can actually use directory services command line to make that user an admin user um, if it already has a secure token, and then we can use it to execute this. So even if your environment, you're not letting your users be admin, um, we can make them admin as part of the script, and then when we go to recreate their new account, you don't necessarily need to make their new account an admin user, but at least that way, you know, we have the permission to be able to create that new user account. Um, and again, just a reminder about secure token, um, you know, primarily uh, the biggest impact of this is going to be if you're going to be utilizing File Vault 2, um, in order for that user to be able to unlock the APFS volume, they have to have a secure token. So just taking a look at, at some of our syntax here, um, you'll see at each one of these lines, if uh, one of these uh, exits with a non-zero exit code, then we will um, We'll pipe it over to exit with a specific exit code so that we can see where in the script it is failing. Um, just kind of some development recommendations. Um, can also see uh, we are uh, launching Jamf Helper as the user uh, using launch control here, uh, simply to ensure that that uh, Jamf Helper window or the OSA script pop-up 
uh, pops up you know, in the user space on the user desktop, so we want to make sure that the user is getting all of these notifications that we're displaying to them and, and walking through that process. Um, and then we have each one of these steps actually uh, calling a specific function within our script, um, rather than just having the script run from top to bottom, allows us to focus our, um, our attention to each one of those functions as we're developing that. And we're also writing out to a log um, using our write log function. Um, and this, in our environment, we actually are shipping these uh, to Amazon CloudWatch. Um, you can ship these uh, either uh, locally on the computer, um, just have them display uh, in the terminal, and then you'll see them in your Jamf policy log. Um, but you know, would certainly encourage you to you know, consider taking a look at how you can take advantage of better logging in your scripts as well. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, one of the final steps is actually to write this launch daemon uh, to the disk so that when the user does log out um, as part of that last step, we then call this policy, uh, which we set up with a custom event of Thunderbolt data migration finalize. Um, and we need to make sure that we call it from the Jamf binary specifically so that those uh, PPPC profile um, uh, authorizations actually allow for uh, setting that user home folder and creating the user account with sysadmin control. Um, and then we used uh, Jamf's PPPC utility uh, available uh, on Jamf's GitHub. Very easy to be able to create this profile, um, but you'll need to make sure that uh, the Jamf binary has all of these authorizations um, prior to uh, deploying. I think the, the Apple events ones are not necessarily standard. Um, I know they do have a pre-built configuration profile with these available on their GitHub as well. Uh, which you then can add in and scope to your computers. You'll just want to make sure that that's scoped to any computers that are running uh, these two uh, policies. And then uh, just taking a look again at um, how we're outputting uh, our log data. We are uh, taking any of this information where the user is uh, selecting uh, or you know, providing feedback. We can actually output that to our log file. Um, and you know, make sure that we have our script in a very readable format. Um, so I'll take some questions about this in a minute. A um, couple other things I wanted to mention is that you know, we are hiring. Um, if this looks like something super fun to you and something that you'd want to uh, you know, get more involved in, um, please take a look at our website. We are uh, you know, always looking to grow our team, and if this is something that sounds like a lot of fun for you, then uh, you know, please do. Um, and we can also uh, connect with you on LinkedIn. We're always looking for referral partners, people that we can work with on certain projects. Um, I'm on Mac Admin Slack, and also, you know, as I said, all this is available up on our GitHub page. So, uh, with that, I'd like to, to open things up for questions. I know I kind of buzzed through that pretty quick, but I imagine that there may be some questions about how we how we did this. So, I also have some scripts um, that run through uh, Jamf now in my self-service that is causing us prompts and Catalina is stopping it from happening right now like it just literally will not execute and I don't know if it's because it's trying to run through root or is it this or would this as user um, for the OSA script prompt for the Apple script prompt actually work oh sorry no 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 it's okay I uh, just was here at somebody's phone um, we have not necessarily done extensive testing on this in Catalina yet, so I don't necessarily have an answer for you, but if okay. you want to reach out, I'd um, be more than happy to, to do a little bit more digging. Um, I do know that uh, launching uh, OSA script or launching Jamf Helper as the user tends to help with some of that, but I do know that some of these, uh, there are some new privacy protections in yeah. 1015 Catalina that uh, we may need to account for, um, and I just haven't done extensive testing as the, the betas are, are quite early at this point. So all your prompts are, are OSA scripts, right? Uh, OSA script or Jamf Helper. Or Jamf, Jamf Helper can just give you um, dialog buttons, but to actually put... Right, so the ones where we're asking for a password, the one that we're asking for you know, them to select a specific volume, those are all going to be OSA script. Um, okay. But then our, our full screen uh, yeah. window and also some of the dialog boxes where they're just clicking OK or Cancel, um, some of those are, are called by Jamf Helper. Have you looked at the ability, because a lot of times we have text go out, and of being able to remove the account from an old machine to an external drive and then move that over to a new machine instead of just the direct uh, Thunderbolt? You should be able to do it the same way. Uh, you just you know, need to update the logic in the script depending on where you place it. But if it were um, inside of a user's folder, 
Uh, that's all that we're looking for is an external volume that has a users folder and then okay. a users home folder inside of that users folder. That would work just the same um, yeah. if you connected an external volume yeah. um, either by USB or Thunderbolt. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to get two 27-inch iMacs next to each other to use the Thunderbolt. <laughs> Unless you have a long cable, yeah, yeah, it can be a little challenging for sure. All right. Cool. Right behind you, I think. Hi, my name's Brianna. Um, Hi. My question is, could you possibly do like an authenticated restart instead of holding the, the password temporarily? I know it, it benefits you for um, creating the, the user, but could you possibly just auth do an auth restart somehow? I, I'm, I've been having trouble with that with Mojave anyway, so um, is there any way we could do that instead at any point? So um, I'm not sure that the authenticated restart would help in this particular case. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that we need that, that account password is because we're creating the user account. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, if we, if we needed to reboot, then you know, the authenticated restart would, would help so that we wouldn't have to then prompt the user for you know, one of those two passwords. Um, uh, I think- Do you uh, have any um, scripts that are for that? Yeah, so there is a command um, to initiate an authenticated restart. Um, is it when you're running software updates or is it just? Yeah, that's okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. So what we've found is that actually kicking off a software update command and then kicking off an authenticated restart command mm -hmm. is, does not work according, you know, doesn't work the way you would expect it to. Mm -hmm. However, if you run software update um, and you tell it to go ahead and restart, it actually does an authenticated restart as part of the software update command. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say rather than having it try to do two things separately, mm -hmm. just use that uh, flag within the software update command and that should present a little bit better behavior. Um, we worked on, as I mentioned, that previous tool uh, to kind of remind users to run their updates um, and we're just using that command, the, um, the software update uh, with a restart um, in order to flag. do that. And that okay. does actually result in an authenticated restart. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I can throw it that far. <laughs> Everybody survived. So how, how does this work with mobile accounts? Um, so it is currently uh, set up to work with local accounts. I have talked to a few folks about how they'd like to use this with uh, mobile Active Directory accounts. Um, it should be possible. Um, I just haven't necessarily done a whole lot of work on that, but I, you know, would certainly encourage you to uh, uh, to work through that and uh, you know submit a pull request. We'd love to add that functionality in. Um, basically, all all that we need to do is, I mean, those those home folders are stored in the same location. Right. Um, uh, one one idea that I was kind of bouncing around with somebody that brought this up to me earlier was that uh, we might be able to have those permissions changes occur at the login, like uh, with a login trigger. Um, you know, with that login hook when the user first logs in. Um, kind of just going to depend on, I, I think I'd have to try a couple things and see what would work. Um, but yeah, uh, we wouldn't necessarily be able to bring over that definition for that uh, user account because it's actually stored in the directory and it, you know, creates that super long user ID. Um, so if you, if you tried to run it as is, would it bring it over just as a local account or would it fail entirely? It would just bring it over as a local account because all we're doing is bringing over the home folder. Um, and then what the sysadmin CTL command is doing is creating a local account with the same username and password that match the keychain. Um, so yeah, if you were to use this on a mobile account, it would just bring it over as a local account, which might actually be more appealing depending on um, it, it is appealing. if that's <laughs> depending on whether you're trying to move away from mobile accounts. Yeah. But yeah, this would definitely solve that for you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm actually doing something similar with, with a script I wrote several years ago that I, I'm using for mobile accounts. Um, it, it doesn't move the entire uh, home folder. It just moves the data inside of it uh, using rsync and SSH keys. Um, but it, it's, it's meant for text to use, really, not for end users. Right. Um, so it does very similar um, things that this one is doing, probably with less error checking and whatnot. <laughs> but... Uh, um, Which was basically what we had before we, we ported it over to make it uh, for the end user, right. but yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it works well. So you just you put in the IP address of the old machine, uh, it SSH is over, creates keys, so you don't have to put your password in again, and then from then on, it, it just pulls the desktop documents, downloads sequentially, and then it gets the wallpaper and the Firefox stuff and all that kind of stuff. So, Yeah, the, the main thing that we ran into was that um, there are 
moving over the entire user's library while the user is logged in is not something that works very reliably. Um, so uh, that was why we decided to have it actually swap out the user account. Is you know in, in this case the user hadn't really been using it much. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to just bring over other data uh, rather than um, replacing the user home folder, you could probably do that if you weren't trying to move over everything inside the user home folder. Yeah, I haven't had any issues yet. I I'll, okay. I'll only move files. I okay. don't move configuration settings or anything like that. Got it. Cool. Uh, you mentioned that uh, if uh, if uh, there is that uh, management management account, uh, instead of asking the user's credential, we can use that uh, the management account credential. But do you have any uh, suggestion how we can put that uh, credential securely into that uh, script or policy? Um, I would probably recommend using it as uh, rather than having it actually be stored in the script because that obviously has a whole lot of problems. Um, not to mention that scripts when they're brought down from Jamf Pro are cached locally on the computer inside of the application support folder. Um, we have uh, inside of a policy we've got um, the ability to store you know, variables that you can then call via the parameters. Um, so if you used uh, place those into the parameters uh, of the script rather than placing them into the script itself, um, at least at that point you won't be able to you know, see that stored locally on the computer. Um, so in most cases that's what I've seen. Um, the other thing you could do is you know, change that management account password to something that you feel is okay to uh, you know, be left somewhat insecure and then use another policy to change it back once this completes. Um, but yeah, uh, ensuring security of that management account, um, I know, is, is something that is quite important. Um, main thing to keep in mind if you are going to try to do it with the management account is to ensure that your management account has a secure token. Um, because if you are not enrolling using DEP, it's not going to have a secure token uh, automatically. You would have to have the user authenticate to be able to grant it a secure token. So, cool. It's a practical question about the Thunderbolt cable so uh, this is appealing to my remote users since um, they don't have my script but d do you just recommend that people require that for every computer purchase you buy a hundred dollars worth of Thunderbolt cables and Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 2 adapter <laughs> and just ship it with them or do y'all give them one and have them sh ship it back it kind of depends. Um, it, this was built for, for a client that was doing this inside a, you know, a physical office, so they just had a location in the office where these cables were available and a user could use one and put it back. Um, you could certainly ship it with the new computer if you're sending the, the user their new computer in a box. Um, chances are if you're replacing their computer, maybe you want the old one back and you could just tell them put the cable in the, the box when box, you ship the yeah. old one back. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess that's just a decision about how you want to manage your Thunderbolt cables. But yeah, uh, certainly yeah. We, we need to uh, make sure that the user has a cable to do it. Um, you could also potentially you know, set this up to run over, uh, over a network connection or something like that, as, as I think you had mentioned. Um, really, in this case, uh, we felt that Thunderbolt was super fast, uh, probably going to be more reliable. Um, and for the particular customer we were building this for, they only had wireless networks. So um, trying to do this over Wi-Fi, if anybody's tried Migration Assistant over Wi-Fi, uh, it's kind of slow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're just talking unrelated within Jamf Pro, mm -hmm. um, whether you can configure um, a mobile app or, a, or an app store app uh, with yeah. the API. Um, I don't work for Jamf, nor do I develop the product, so I, I, can't cer I certainly can't speak on future you know, features or, or product releases, but I do know that um, we are transitioning to a new API um, from our classic API, and I know that there is a lot of interest in putting many more endpoints into that new API. Um, but I know that that still is in beta and is still in development. So um, if it's not there now, stay tuned. And you know, I would love that too, because we uh, we orchestrate a number of different Jamf Pro instances, and being able to do the same thing to more than one, um, you know, programmatically, really, really good stuff. <laughs> um, and yeah, if anybody else has got any kind of other off the wall questions, I realize I kind of blew through my my time here, and well the opposite of blowing through my time. I guess we went a little bit quick. Um, so if anybody's got other questions, more than happy to, to go through that, or if we want to take a look at, at the source code a little bit more uh, in depth, I'm more than happy to do that as well. 
could you go over a little bit more how you you said you had to make a second a second call to Jamf to bypass the TCCC or whatever that was the second policy, the second policy. yeah, yeah. Right. right so let me I'm gonna just pull up here on on github so I can show what we're talking about here um, so as as we've listed and I should probably set up my zoom and set this to mirror there we go there we go awesome cool so in order for the commands that we're running um, as part of the finalization where we actually take our user home folder that we're placing into a temporary folder and we actually bring it over and make it the user's user account folder. Um, that requires uh, the privacy uh, authorization uh, for full disk access or all files as it's listed in the PPPC utility. Um, and in order for us to be able to do that, we need to make sure that that command is being executed by the Jamf binary. Um, but we need to make sure that it's running separately from the policy that the user has clicked on in self-service because we actually have to have them log out. So we need to quit self-service. Um, so what we're doing is creating a launch daemon as part of that, which uh, we have here. And what that launch daemon then does is it loads immediately once the user is logged out. So we write the launch daemon, we then log them out, and we load the launch daemon. And what that does is then calls this second policy. Um, so we, we have two policies inside of Jamf Pro, one that is in self-service, and then one that has a custom trigger of Thunderbolt data migration finalized. Um, and when it calls that policy, that's where then we have it call this second script. So we actually see we have two different scripts here in our repo. Um, and apparently I'm not online, but I had you fooled there for a second, didn't I? All right. Give that a minute. And so then this second script, we'll see, doesn't do a whole lot, but it does a couple things. Um, we delete the existing user um, using sysadmin.ctl, making sure that it is present, and then we delete it. Um, then we relaunch the login window. And a little bit further down here, we'll see we move the files from our migrator tool dash username folder to the location of their actual user account. We create the user account, um, and then we, again, remove the old account, the temporary one that we created with the secure token. Uh, we remove the uh, plist, which has the user's credentials in it, and then we change the ownership of those files so that they're owned by the new user account that we just created. Um, and then at that point, we have it uh, relaunch login window um, and allow us to log in. So that's why we, we have to kind of have two different policies, one that does the you know, pre-staging of all the migration, and then the second one to swap that user account out. Um, and that, that second piece is what requires um, the uh, full disk access for the Jamf binary, and that's why we have to, rather than calling this script in our launch daemon, we're actually calling the policy. Yeah. Yep. So do you have a, a profile installed to allow full disk access? Jamf. That we do. Jamf also does it by default now. Um, I think it'll give it the full disk access, but the Apple events in order to use the sysadmin CTL binary, that's where we would actually need either to create the profile um, as I had shown here, where then you give the allow uh, for Apple events, or what you could do is you could go over to github.com slash Jamf. I don't know if he's using a tool that somebody at Jamf wrote to mm -hmm. build these. I don't know yeah. if everyone's noticed. They just made a tool to allow you to make privacy policy payloads. <coughs> it's extremely handy. <laughs> and they just will directly upload the privacy policy payloads to your Jamf instance. So in Jamf's uh, GitHub repo, we actually have already a, a mobile config file that's created. So you could actually just use this one if you didn't want to create your own with the PPPC utility. Um, but I, I imagine a good number of folks in the room have at least used that utility or tried it out or at least aware of its existence if you're not already on 1014. Um, so this is a specific thing that you uh, will need for computers running Mojave, but our, uh, we built the script 
for users to migrate to new computers in 2019. So we assume that at this point, um, if they're getting a new computer shipped to them, it's going to be coming with 10.14 installed, um, and we'll need to, to deal with that. Um, but you can also just grab this off of Jamf's uh, GitHub page. Uh, the specific profile you need is this Jamf Apple Events one, which is in their Jamf Privacy Preferences Policy Control Profiles repo. So is that first policy installing that? No, so you just uh, add this in your configuration profiles uh, within Jamf Pro. This so you just want to make sure that that's scoped to the computer prior to this executing. Right, so you have, you have to make sure that's there or else this migration won't work. Right. right, the last stage of the migration where we actually go to create the user account would fail. Can, yeah, the catch box will allow it to get on the recording. I'm in the enterprise environment, um, and I don't know if you guys have encountered, are you in place upgrading to the latest OS or to Mojave, because we're not with Catalina yet. Um, how are you getting around authenticated restarts? Because that's where I'm having trouble. So that question's for everybody. Um, and I'm trying to do an authenticated restart. After the, the, the start OS install runs and it restarts. It does itself. It does it though, and, and it You need 10.14.4 um, or higher. The authenticator restart seems, I mean, it works for us with the start OS install. Mm -hmm. we, we got it working. They broke authenticator restart from 10, 12, 3 yeah. till something, but it seems to be working for us on 10, 14, 4. I mean, if it doesn't do, it, it did the authenticator restart mm -hmm. to start the install. You will still need a final prompt in which mm -hmm. the user logs in. It's still going to need another 10 minutes. Yeah. But the majority of it does get that. done. Mm -hmm. It's yes. doing that first authenticated restart to just pass it file vault that one time. Right. I don't even really want it the one time. But but I just wanted it anyway. And if you're it. upgrading from an operating system mm -hmm. before and you're actually you're if the drive's converting to APFS during that mm -hmm. um, installation, then your user is going to have to at least authenticate once after okay. the upgrade. Okay. Um, yeah. So there were things and scripts out that would um, make a plist, would store the user's um, you know password, and then make a plist and uh, load that. I think it might have been a launch daemon, um, and and then it would use that to to bypass that restart. It would use that. Yeah, um, a number of the recent OS releases though do include firmware updates, so um, you know keeping that that credential stored. Um, in RAM, in order to do that authenticated restart with major OS upgrades, okay. is Less not likely. something that might, you know, may not in fact be possible okay. um, in all cases. But um, certainly with, you know, minor OS updates and that sort of thing, that, that should work. Um, but if it's a major OS upgrade, especially if you're moving from like an HFS plus formatted 1013 or okay. something okay. earlier, then um, the user's mm -hmm. probably going to have to type in their password at some point. Yeah, exactly. They, they're dealing yeah. with it, you know, but... It's yeah, it sucks, but I haven't found a way around that part, yeah. though. Well, good to know I'm sharing my disagree. <laughs> That's all. Anybody else? Uh, thoughts? Questions? Yeah, we're here in the back. Um, so, I haven't used Z Shell very much. I don't know, you know, if it's super popular at all in any environments. But is the syntax so different from Bash that you you really? I mean, obviously, you want to be ready for it. But I would say ninety nine percent of the commands that you would run in Bash are going to be supported in Z Shell. Okay. Um, so, main thing I would say is. You know, take a look at some of the documents online about differences between Z Shell and Bash. Um, the main thing is, is that you'll get access to newer functionality that you probably have in Bash on Linux, but you don't have on Mac OS because right. uh, you know, the newer versions of Bash are licensed with GPLv3 and that you know, therefore cannot be included as part of Mac OS. Um, so uh, the nice thing about uh, Z Shell is that it has a much more open license um, and can be included in commercial software. Um, so you'll get a lot, you know, additional functionality and not lose a whole lot of your legacy stuff. I think a big part of the reason why Apple chose Z Shell was because it does have a lot of compatibility um, back to SH or, or Bash, depending on um, what you're looking at. But um, I, you know, 
main thing you'd want to run through is just to make sure that you know your scripts run as expected. Um, but you know, just like writing a shell in SH versus writing it in Bash, ninety percent of the things are going to be the same. There's just going to be a few things that are a little different. Um, about but in fact, we found scripts, some so. some really nice things about Z shell that. Um, we'll probably start to take advantage of going forward, like the ability to have you know subshells within functions and that sort of thing that um, are not supported in the version of Bash that's on Mac OS currently. Um, so, uh, if anything, I would say it's just you know going to open up some things and and really not necessarily cause a whole lot of trouble. Um, main thing was just pointing out that we're trying to future proof ourselves a little bit by you know using. Um, that is the default shell, and Z shell has been present in Mac OS all the way back to 10.4. Um, I think maybe even further back than that. It was the default in uh, 10.2, wasn't it? I th uh, it may have been. I think it was TCSH, yeah, which right. actually yeah. is theoretically more similar to Z shell than to Bash, but um, uh, either way, uh, even if you write scripts and you have computers that are running older versions of the OS, there you know is no reason why you couldn't uh, write it uh, and mean, have it use the Z shell. Did and TCSH came over to Bash with no issue, so I'm, I'm yep. hoping. I just don't. I look at my list of scripts in Jamf, and I think, you know, what if there's one line in one script, and I don't want to go through all of them. But no, that's uh, you know, you got some time to do some testing. Bash isn't going away in 10.15. It's just they're saying it it may be removed in a future version. Um, we'll see when that actually happens. I'd say the the folks that are scripting in Python are probably going to have a little bit uh, of a greater work effort to to make right. sure that things are, uh, you know ported over for Python 3, as you know, there are some significant changes between Python 2.7 and Python 3. Um, but e both of those binaries, I think, are uh, still going to ship in Catalina, um, although you know, we're not Python. entirely certain about that at this point. Oh, okay. um, but I know, at least in the betas, both, both versions of Python are present. So. At least from what I've read. I'm not a, big, not a big Python developer, but I know there are many folks in the community that are. We have to keep everybody in here. Are we uh <laughs> well, if anybody has any additional questions, feel free to come find me. Uh, table next to the uh, Jamf table downstairs, um, across from the registration desk. Um, thanks everybody for coming, and uh, hope this tool is helpful to some of the some of you guys. Really appreciate it.